Public key infrastructure allows complete strangers to communicate with each other by trusting a third party. It allows two entities or two users on a network to exchange data and establish a secure connection without those two users ever having to meet or exchange information with one another. Instead, what happens is that digital certificates are exchanged between the users and users are able to verify that the digital certificates are issued by a trusted third party. That trusted third party is known as the certificate authority. So public key infrastructure uses these digital cert certificates, which are used in conjunction with asymmetric encryption. Sometimes this is called public key infrastructure or PKI encryption, public key infrastructure encryption. Sometimes this is just called asymmetric encryption. Uh, within asymmetric encryption within a PKI environment is also called PKI encryption. A public and private key pair is used with the certificate to exchange information between the two entities or between the two users and allow those users to exchange uh, securely. Technologies such as transport layer security and HTTPS, which uses transport layer security, rely on public key infrastructure in a very large scale. You can also have public key infrastructure at an enterprise level or within your company, your organization, where you would have a smaller scaled version of public key infrastructure. So the way this works is through the use of certificates. A certificate is just a digital document. It's a document that has information about the issuer. It has a public key embedded in it in many times, and it's used to identify an entity or identify a website. Think of a certificate, it's a good analogy to think of a certificate as a driver's license. When two people exchange driver's license or you go into uh, a restaurant and you want to order an alcoholic beverage and ask for your identification, you show them your, your driver's license to show prove your age, that's going to be very similar to what a certificate is. The person at the restaurant, the waiter, the waitress is not going to trust that you are claiming the age that you're, you're stating. They're going to trust this third party, which would be the government, the state government to issue this driver's license and the driver's license would have the information. The same thing happens with public infrastructure. Two entities don't necessarily trust each other. They may have never met or have no idea each other really exist before having to exchange data, but they would trust the certificate authority, the issuer of the digital certificate. So you're not trusting the, or the organization or the entity itself. You're trusting this trusted third party, the certificate authority. Now, a certificate authority is going to have what's known as a root certificate, which is used to identify the certificate authority itself. It's also going to have a private key and a public key. The public key is going to freely distribute and include on all of its certificates that that certificate authority issues. And that public key is what travels with the certificate or is embedded with the certificate and allows uh, users to verify that the certificate that they have already issued by that certificate authority matches what the certificate or the, the key that's being sent with the certificate that's being sent by the third party. So that asymmetric encryption helps, it uses uh, the certificate and the asymmetric encryption to help prove an identity. Let's visualize that for a little bit here. So if we take a look at this diagram, we have two individuals, we have Mary and Aaron. They wanna communicate. So what Mary is gonna do is she's going to use her private key and her public key to help communicate. Her private key here is in black and her public key is in white here. So what she's gonna do is she's gonna have an unencrypted message. Hey Aaron, this is Mary, just saying hi. Something like that. She's going to include a copy of her public key and a certificate and then also take her public or her private key she's going to take her private key and create an encrypted hash of the message she's going to embed that in the certificate along with the public key and send that over to Aaron so Aaron has a copy now of Mary's public key and has 
he has the certificate that has uh, that encrypted hash. So what Aaron could do now is Aaron could hash that message that he received. He could hash that message and get maybe this hash right here and then compare it to the hash that was included with the digital certificate. So, or with the, the certificate there. So if the two hashes match, then Aaron knows that Mary sent the message and that integrity was maintained. The message wasn't tampered with in any way and that the message was encrypted using Mary's private key because Mary has included a copy of her public key and a copy of the message that she, she hashed inside that certificate. So Aaron can compare the two hashes, the one he calculates and the one Mary calculates to determine if they're the same. And then that would prove Mary's identity. The same type of thing happens with public key infrastructure. So with the within that certificate, you're gonna have some information. You'll have a serial number, you'll have an issuer, you have the subject, uh, period of validity, when it's valid from and to, uh, its expiration, all certificates should have some sort of expiration. And what it's used for also, key information as well. Here's a certificate from cybercrafttraining.com. And you can find this by going into your browser and clicking on that lock icon you'll see in the browsing bar and then going to more information and viewing the certificate there. You can view it right through your browser for any website. So if you're interested in digging into what a certificate looks like, you can do it that way. Here's just the certificate we have for cybercrafttraining.com. We have the common name of the website, the period that this certificate's valid for. It's only valid for a few months and then it'll be reissued. It has a public key here with the RSA algorithm, Rivas Shamir Adelman, Key Science 2048. And we have that information all within the certificate itself. So how does this fit in? How do the certificates fit in with public infrastructure and how how is public key infrastructure really uh, work? It's well, it, we have to trust that trusted third party, that certificate authority to issue these certificates. As entities, entities aren't trusting one another. There's two devices on a computer network that uses public infrastructure don't inherently trust one another, but they would trust the certificate authority. And for the internet, you have major companies such as Iden Trust, Digicert, Sictigo being the major certificate authorities for the entire web. They, for example, Iden Trust issues over half of all certificates used on the internet for any given website. So when you connect to a website, you're not trusting that the website is secure. You're trusting that a certificate authority is validated that a website is secure. You're trusting that certificate authority to do that validation. So when the website sends you a certificate, your browser is able to identify that the certificate is valid. So that's gonna look a little bit like this here. So we have a website, we have a website here we have the certificate authority, we have the user and the user's browser, and the browser's root certificate store. And we go through a few steps whenever we're implementing PKI. The very first step is gonna be that the certificate authority would have their, their certificate validated and, and included on each of the major browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Brave, whatever type of browsers are being used. The certificate authority wants to make sure that any certificate that's issued by that certificate authority can be recognized by those browsers. So it adds uh, its certificate to the browser's root certificate store. Next, you'll have a website that will submit what's known as a certificate signing request or a CSR to the certificate authority. So maybe it's a new website or maybe the website has their certificate expire after a given time. So that website issues the certificate signing request. The certificate authority then provides the signed certificate to the website. Now the website has a signed certificate. My head will be the website. <laughs> and then whenever users attempt to establish a connection with the website, they're gonna try and connect with TLS or HTTPS. And then the, the website is gonna send back a signed certificate. The browser is going to be able to recognize that certificate 
using the browser's root certificate store and the public private key pair. So it's going to be able to validate that the public key sent in this certificate matches the public key in the root certificate store. And then from there, it's going to be able to determine that that website can be trusted. And then we can establish a secure uh, TLS session there. Now, oftentimes, certificate authorities, you know, something like Identrust or Satiga, they're going to be enormous organizations. They'll probably have multiple certificate authorities. They, some of them have thousands and thousands. So you might have a hierarchy that you would see instead of just one certificate authority, you'd have what's known as your root certificate authority. And that root certificate authority is often kept offline. It's kept off of the internet entirely to help prevent hacking attempts because if the private key is ever compromised, if hackers get a hold of the private key, they can then compromise any certificate that relies on that root certificate authority. So you never, a lot of organizations just keep the root certificate authority offline. And then you'll have what are known as intermediate costs. Now maybe this is a international company like Digicert. They would probably have intermediate costs based on region, based on United States, Europe, um, just various regions, you know, Southeast Asia. They might even break it up further then. You'd have, you know, maybe North America, and then we have United States, Canada, Mexico. We break it up by country, and then we might break it up by state or province. So they would have multiple intermediate cause, and this would be a hierarchical approach. Everything would map back to the root cause. We'd have intermediate cause. They could also be called child or subordinate cause. And then the final cause in that chain would issue the certificates from the users or to the users, to the websites, etc. cetera. Uh, and they would handle any certificate signing requests. Sometimes those certificate signing requests are also managed by what's known as a registration authority. So a large certificate authority like Iden Trust will have various registration authorities that help handle the certificate signing requests. So they're specific servers basically that manage any CSRs that come in to the, uh, the PKI infrastructure. Now, if it's a smaller certificate authority or if, if it's a smaller PKI environment, like with a private company, you might just have the certificate authority and that's it. You might not even need an intermediate CA or a registration authority. There might not be that many requests on any given day, but sometimes you would have a registration authority, especially if it's a larger organization. So that's PKI explained. A lot of people get tripped up with this, but just remember it's a way to exchange certificates to prove or to show trust and who you're trusting. You're trusting that trusted third party, that certificate authority to then establish a secure connection between two entities.